I'm Farwell Brown, and today we're going to talk a bit about Chautauqua, Chautauqua Day. Sometimes I call the subject the good old Chautauqua Days. The most American thing in America is the way Theodore Roosevelt described it. Anyone who has, was born in Ames sometime around 1910 probably recalls something of Chautauqua's week-long and sometimes longer sessions that were held in August every year out at Maxwell Park. Maxwell Park became a part of the Ames Municipal Cemetery. It was 17 acres of land that was owned between 13th Street and about where 10th Street would be, as they say, in the north part of today's Municipal Cemetery. Chautauqua was a name that was taken from a permanently established institution located on the shores of Lake Chautauqua in western New York State. Methodist Bishop John H. Vincent was a founder of that summertime educational and edu cultural program and back in 1873. Vincent had been associated with the Lyceum programs of New England that provided a pulpit for men like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Amos Bronson Alcott, Henry Ward Beecher, and Samuel Clemens. The Chautauqua idea included religious and cultural training for all of the family. Programs, educational programs were held in the summer months primarily at Ch on Chautauqua Lake and uh, correspondence courses. In 1904, my own grandmother completed a four-year reading program with the Chautauqua, Chautauqua Institute. The Clorinda Heralds describes Chautauqua as the people's university. It leads to a broader cultural and higher standard of character, non-sectarian, promoting fraternity and elevating the home, the church, and the state. It was a man named Keith Vauder who brought his booking, through his booking agency, took the Chautauqua's cultural ideas and moved them on to the rest of the country. Combining culture with entertainment, blended in turn with the tent show and the camp meeting traditions. The traveling or the circuit Chautauqua that resulted, like the one on Chautauqua Lake, had a religious and a moral emphasis. Chautauqua has been described as an important chapter in American social and intellectual life. It was in August of 1904 that the Chautauqua first opened in Ames. The Ames Intelligence of August 11th of 1904 devoted its entire center page to the editorializing about Chautauqua as follows. Wednesday, October 17th, marks the beginning of the Ames Chautauqua. Arrangements already made involve an expenditure for entertainment and instructive talent larger by far than ever before expanded in this county for any similar pro purpose. And this obligation has not been lightly or blindly incurred for a wise discrimination has been used in selection of all of the features. Only ability of the highest order could have developed the great reputation of most of the speakers that will be appearing on the program. AIM should accord this movement all necessary support, aside from its good influences, which are certain to be of advantage to the community. Business reasons of the best require that this be generously done. Now, Chautauqua grounds here first were located on the west side of downtown Ames. A large tent was pitched in the area between what is now 6th Street and 9th Street on the high ground overlooking what is now Brookside Park. Buggies were parked on the low flat where the tennis courts and the horseshoe courts are now located. Today, if you live in Brookridge, on Brookridge, or Ridgewood Avenues, south of 9th Street, you live in the Chautauqua addition to Ames, a subdivision that was laid out under the date of April 13, 1909. After the Chautauqua program had been moved to the east side of town, to the Chautauqua Park that I first referred to. Prior to 1909, 
Folks went to Chautauqua in horse-drawn buggies. At least most of them did. By about 1908, those who were driving cars were advised to go to the grounds by way of the west end of Knight Street, where a special entrance had been arranged to, to the parking area. Horse-drawn buggies should be go over the 6th Street viaduct to the south entrance. In that way, there would be less chance of cars frightening the horses. Those early Chautauqua programs were immediately popular in Ames. Family camping on the grounds during the week-long sessions grew in popularity. By the fourth year, there were 50 or more family tents on the grounds for the duration. In those early years, the local Chautauqua committees, or boards, did less newspaper advertising of the programs than they did later. Programs were selected by a local board, by board members from, from the offerings of the booking agencies. In 1911, Parley Sheldon, J.J. Grove, Carl Little, and Dr. Chrisman, who made up the Ames Chautauqua Program Committee, attended a Chautauqua Alliance meeting in Des Moines, where they obtained the information on upcoming available talent. A number of Chautauqua bureaus sprang up across the country, serving as booking agencies. One was the Red Path Bureau that would provide the entire week's scheduled program, including the Big Tent. Judge Lindsay, the Denver Ju Juvenile Court judge, was a, was a popular uh, man on the Red Path circuit. The judge was the headliner on the Ames Chautauqua in 1907. There were over 2,000 communities that had Chautauqua programs between 1904 and 1930. Driving through the Midwest towns in those years, in the late summer weeks, you would see banners strung across the business streets advertising their Red Path or some other Chautauqua system programs. Some, like Ames, were locally managed, but drew upon the bureaus for their bookings. Chautauqua programs in Ames were always high class, while there was a tent show flavor. The talent included renowned professors from universities and colleges. There was no sideshow atmosphere about it. There would be musical troops, sometimes from nearby communities. For example, in 1908, the patrons of the Ames Chautauqua were treated to a genuine Sanger Fest when they heard the grand concert of the 158-voice Norwegian Choral Union of Story County. The Ames City Band was often featured in concert during Chautauqua Week. There were traveling bands, such as, the, as Norton's Chautauqua Band and Orchestra. Male quartets and women's string ensembles gave both introductory and full concert offerings. With such fair came lectures like the ones on household econo economics furnished by a Mabel Bentley in 1915 and the one on family health by a Dr. William Sadler. I recall the yodelers with the Swiss Alpine chorus and the anvil chorus played with special lighting effects and the Swiss bell ringers. There were special evenings for local talent plays and there were the traveling theatrical players groups one listed as Nixon and his jolly players has an interesting ring today. President A.B. Storms of Iowa State was appearing on Chautauqua programs across Iowa in those days speaking about higher education. Storms once delivered a Saturday evening lecture uh, on the Ames Chautauqua platform as well as a sermon on the Sunday morning program when the Ames churches held a joint service as a part of Chautauqua. S. Parks Cadman, the nationally known preacher from New York City, came to Ames on the Chautauqua circuit. Ames High Principal, that is between 1913 and 17, Albert Caldwell, spent at least one season, season on the Chautauqua circuit talking about his family's miraculous survival of the Titanic sinking in 1912. W.S. Roop, who became the publisher of the Ames Tribune in 1935, operated his Acme Chautauqua Bureau out of Des Moines. 
In the late years of Chautauqua, Roop combined that agency with parts of several other agencies, such as the Red Path and the original water systems. One of the last successful operators, Roop's Chautauqua career spanned the years between 1913 and 1932. In 1923, Roop's Acme Chautauqua Bureau included among its program offerings the Temple Festival Singers of Ames. Members of the group included Mrs. W.H. Sunderland, soprano, Miss Lena Dorb Berg, known by many people in Ames, who she became the wife of Shorty Saletter of Ames, mezzo soprano, Miss Helen Rayburn, contralto, Miss Rosalind Cook, alto, and pianist Clifford Bloom, tenor, and Howard Cation, baritone. Miss Cook was on the college staff. Sunderland, Berg, and Rayburn were music students of Talbert McRae, then head of the music department at the college. Bloom was on Drake's music staff, and he also was the director of, the, of music at the Collegiate Presbyterian Church here in Ames. Howard Cation was one of the leaders and members of the Iowa State College's popular student AMES Quartet at the time. The group made 85 successful appearances on Chautauqua stages in Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota, and Wisconsin during that 1923 season. Chautauqua was moved to its new site east of Maxwell Avenue and south of 13th Street in 1909. The main entrance was off of Maxwell at about where 10th Street would be, as I recall. However, a special entrance off of 13th Street was provided for those driving cars. William Jennings Bryan appeared more than once on the Ames platform. He was here in 1909 and again in 1915 and in 1921. But it was Billy Sunday appearing in 1911 at the Ames Chautauqua who drew the all-time record crowd of 4,000 people to the Chautauqua Park at Ames. There were two subjects that Chautauqua speakers were said to have always been in agreement upon. One was temperance and the other one was women's suffrage. Liquor, it was the consensus at that time, was being eliminated from society. And women's right to vote was no longer a debatable question. The country was moving rapidly at that point toward the twin 18th and 19th Amendments during the years, first years of Chautauqua. The woman's suffrage tent was usually just inside the entrance to the grounds. It was said that no man dared to refuse the literature that was handed to him as he entered. Robert M. La Follette, the controversial Wisconsin senator and flaming reformer, was a featured political lecturer in 19... 08. That same year, Robert Bushnell, Doctor of Divinity, and Booker T. Washington were featured on the Ames program. There was one night for the magician. Daytime programs included morning play, playground activity for children that uh, was conducted by physical education people from public schools or colleges who found summer employment on the Chautauqua circuits. For example, Ms. Tilden, who was the head of the physical education, women's phys ed at Iowa State, headed up the, that type of program for the Red Path system for several summers. Ames headliners that appeared on Ames Chautauqua programs were such other names as Dr. Glenn Frank, editor of the American Mer Mercury, who later became the president of the University of Wisconsin. Former U.S. President William Howard Taft, Alfalfa Bill Murray, the governor of Oklahoma, Albert Hubbard, writer and philosopher, and Utah Senator Frank J. Cannon, who traveled the Chautauqua circuits with his lecture on modern Mormon kingdom. One evening during the 1911 Chautauqua, a hailstorm hit Ames, bringing down a portion of the Chautauqua tent and scattering the crowd. No injuries other than soaking resulted, but immediate plans for the construction of a steel-framed auditorium were instigated. A fundraising campaign was aided by Captain W. M. Greeley's gift on his 73rd birthday of $1,000 toward the estimated cost of $6,000 for that auditorium. In March 1912, 
Funds had been raised, and on August 15, 1912, the new auditorium, seating 3,000 people, was dedicated. C.R. Quaid presented the auditorium to the people of Ames that evening. He spoke of it as a dream that had begun eight years earlier. That would have been in 1904. It was to be known as the W.M. Greeley Auditorium. Reverend J.W. Innes of the Presbyterian Church, Church gave the invocation that evening. Reverend W.T. Minchin of the Congregational Church was the platform manager for the Chautauqua here in Ames that year. The combination of World War I and the flu epidemic of 1918 nearly devastated the Ames Chautauqua program. In 1918, Chautauqua was combined with the 4th of July celebration and was reduced to a four-day series starting with a typical 4th of July patriotic celebration held at the Chautauqua Park. The post-war era of flappers and lax attitudes made it difficult for Chautauqua to regain its former momentum. In 1919, a financial loss of some $1,100 discouraged the committee and they suspended the program entirely for the year of 1920. However, there was much interest still exist existing in the Chautauqua idea and aims. In 1921, after a benefit social was held, sponsored in part by the Women's Club of Ames, to put the program back in the, into the black, a new start was made. That year, 1921, the Ames Independent Chautauqua aligned itself with a booking agent, James Lohr, and his independent cooperative Chautauquas of Bloomington, Illinois. Lohr was then serving independent Chautauquas in the Midwest, numbering 300 communities. Advertising and publicity was improved and much increased. Lohr allowed local communities to pick their own program selections, but his organization made scheduling easier, resulting in economies as well. Lohr's organization personified the principles advanced by the, by the Chautauqua idea from the very beginning. For example, a first principle was that Sunday programs had to be suitable for the day. A second principle was that the conduct of the talent both on and off the platform must be above both public and private criticism. A third principle was that cheap jazz music was not to be included in any form. Under Lohr, Ames saw more high-class player acting groups. There were also operatic groups added to the programs. The Davies Opera Company, for example, appeared on the Ames program in 1923 and again in 1925. As a boy, I was impressed with the excitement of the auditorium as the crowds gathered on the occasion of an evening program. The setting for the auditorium on the top of the knoll and surrounded by mature oak trees was ideal. The redwood bark on the floor gave it a special look and atmosphere on the inside. I always had bits of redwood bark in my shoes when I went home from Chautauqua. Add to that the effect of the wide stage, its footlights with the stage entrance doors from the dressing rooms on the rear, it all meant that it was a good place to be. Then on the grounds, after the program, on a late summer evening or early fall evening, there was the sound of voices as people visited and the smell of popcorn from the popcorn wagon that was moved from its Main Street location to the Chautauqua grounds during that week. The grounds had its own deep well to supply the battery of drinking fountains located around the well house to the rear of the auditorium. The lights strung about the grounds on poles or trees had their orbits of early autumn bugs about them. It all became a part of my memory of Chautauqua times. The year following building, the building of the new auditorium, the funds were raised for the construction of a new permanent dining hall. It was located along the south side of the main grounds, perhaps 40 yards from the auditorium. A long frame building, perhaps 75 by 30 feet in size, it provided lunch counter services through the day. Refreshments were available there, there as well. I remember the double dip ice cream cones for a nickel in those days. 
Family camping during Chautauqua week was popular with people for a number of years from the town surrounding Ames as well as with Ames people. My grandparents had their tent set up on the camping area, in the camping area that I remember as being east of the auditorium in the midst of the beautiful trees, overlooking the Skunk River Valley. The local paper each year published the list of campers and their place of residence. The number reached 100 once or twice, I'm sure. As a small boy, it was a great event when I was allowed to spend the entire day at Chautauqua and take a nap in my grandfather's tent. In addition to family tents, there were larger tents set up by such organizations as local churches, the Women's Relief Corps, the Christian Scientists, several local professional fraternal organizations, the Ames Women's Club. One of the local papers usually had a first aid tent on the grounds. Chautauqua attendance had peaked before World War I, and it peaked again after 1921, but it began to dwindle by the mid-20s fairly soon. In 1926, the uh, board reduced the number of days involved, and attendance was disappointing. Discussions were held with representatives of the Women's Club, the Chamber of Commerce, and others as to how to increase attendance. Plans were made, however, for a 1927 Chautauqua. In March of 1927, the Chautauqua Board met again with representatives and other, of other Ames organizations to discuss the future of Chautauqua. A consensus had developed that resulted in the Ames Tribune's report of March 9, 1927, that carried the heading, Swan Song is Sung Today for Ames Chautauqua. The next day, a number of Ames people, like Parley Sheldon and Lou Teldon, expressed regret at its demise. A few months later, the Chautauqua Board sold the auditorium to the Ames School Board. Who, who then moved it to the Lincoln Way Athletic Fields for conversion to, into the Ames High School Fieldhouse. Subsequently, the city of Ames acquired the Chautauqua land, adding it to the municipal cemetery, as I indicated earlier. The Tribune reported that there were too many activities in the community that had conflicted with the Chautauqua program schedules. The last Chautauqua tent came down in, in an Iowa town in 1932. One writer put it this way, traveling Chautauqua, which took to the road in 1904, had a glamorous life. It died in 1932 under the hit and run wheels of a Model A Ford on the way to the movies on a new paved road. Radio sent it into the ditch and the Wall Street crash and the subsequent depression gave it the coup de grace. And thus ended the good old Chautauqua days that I remember so well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.